Just by adding a physics body to the balls and bouncers, we already have some collision detection because the objects bounce off each other. But it's not being detected by us, which means we can't do anything about it. In this game, we want the player to win or lose depending on how many green or red slots they hit. So we need to make a few changes here. First, we're going to add some rectangle physics to our slots. Second, we'll name the slots so we know which is which, then name the balls too. Third, we'll make our scene the contact delegate of the physics world. This means tell us when contact occurs between two bodies. And fourth, we'll create a method that handles contacts and does something appropriate. The first step's easy enough. We'll scroll down so we have add child slot base here. I'm going to add a physics body to the slot base. We're going to say slot base dot physics body is equal to an SK physics body using this time rectangle of the slot base dot size. So give me a rectangle physics body the size of the slot base. Just like with the bouncers, these things should not move when they're hit. So we'll say slot base dot physics body question mark dot is dynamic is false. Don't let them be moved when they're hit. The second step's also easy, but bears some explanation. As with the UI kit, it's easy enough to store a property pointing at specific nodes in your scene for when you want to make something happen. And there are lots of times when that's the right solution. But for general use, Apple recommends assigning names to your nodes, then checking the name to see what node it is. We have to have three names in our code. Good slots, bad slots, and balls. This is really easy to do. First, we'll name our good slots up here. So if you have a good slot, make slot base good, slot glow good, but also slot base dot name is equal to good. And for bad slots, we'll say slot base dot name is bad. And that is a string, a regular Swift string. As for balls, up here we create our balls. We have ball position location. We'll add ball dot name is a ball. This means of all the sprite nodes we create, we know exactly which ones are now balls because they have the name ball. We don't need to name the bouncers though, because we don't actually care when their collisions happen. Now comes the tricky part, which is setting up our scene to be the contact delegate of the physics world. The initial change is easy. We just need to conform to the SK physics contact delegate protocol, then set the physics world's contact delegate property to be our scene. The initial change is easy. We just need to conform to a new protocol called SK physics contact delegate. Then set the physics world's contact delegate property to be our scene. But by default, you still won't get notified when things collide. What we have to do is change the contact test bit mask property of our physics objects, which sets the contact notifications for what we want to receive. This needs to introduce a whole new concept, bit masks, and really it does not matter at this point. So I'll take a shortcut for now and return to it in a later project. Let's set up all the contact delegates and bit masks now. First, I'll make sure my game scene class up here inherits from SK scene, but also conforms to the SK physics contact delegate protocol, like this, SK physics contact delegate, like that as a protocol. Now we'll assign the current scene to be the physics world's contact delegate by putting another line of code in did move to view. Down here, we'll say, actually here's even better, physics world dot contact delegate is self. And this is another property that comes from SK scene, our parent class. Now for our shortcut. Let's go ahead and write that code now and you'll see exactly how it looks. We're going to say uh, here, ball dot physics body question mark dot contact test bit mask is equal to ball dot physics body question mark dot collision bit mask nil coalescing zero like that. This first bit mask here, collision bit mask, tells us which nodes should I bump into. And by default, it's set to everything, which is why our balls are already hitting each other and the other bounces. It literally bounce off those things. The contact test bit mask means which collisions do you want to know about? And by default, it's set to nothing. So what it's saying by default is, 
Uh, I want to bounce off everything that has physics bodies, so you get a nice behavior by default. But don't tell me about those collisions, this bit mask here. And this is an optimization. It'll only tell us the collisions we actually care about. So what I'm saying is, you're bouncing off everything. Well, also, please tell us about all those as well. We have to have nil coalescing here because this is optional here. There may not be a physics body. Now, of course, again, we've just literally made the physics body on this line of code here. So we know there's a physics body. You could, if you wanted to, use uh, force unwrapping here and ditch nil coalescing. And that's fine too. But really, there's no real point here. What matters is, at this point, we're saying, you bounce off everything. Great. Please tell us about every single bounce you have. This is not particularly efficient in complicated games where lots of bounces happen all the time, but it'll make no difference at all in this current project. And like I said, we're going to return to this in a later project to explain more. So that line of code lets us detect collisions. Now it's time to write the code that does the hard work. But first, some explanation. When contact between two physics bodies occurs, we don't know what order it will come in. That is, did the ball hit the slot? Or did the slot hit the ball? Or did both happen? And this sounds, the first time you hear it, absolutely like pointless philosophy. But it's important so we need to know which one is the ball. So before looking at the actual contact method, I want to look at two other methods first, because this is our ultimate goal. The first one we're going to call collision between, which we called when a ball collides with something else. The second one, destroy, is going to be called when we're finished with the ball and we want to get rid of it. So I'll scroll down, find some space, and add this method. Funk collision between ball sk node object sk node. If object.name is equal to good, destroy ball ball else uh, if object.name is bad, then destroy ball ball. Uh, we'll need to add as well destroys. So we'll do func destroy ball some sk node ball dot remove from parent. Boom. So there is some new code in here. Uh, sk node particularly. Sk node is the parent class of sk sprite node. And it's helpful because there are lots of kinds of sprite kit nodes. We've seen uh, sprite nodes here. There are shape nodes as well. There's label nodes are used shortly. Uh, and they all inherit from SK node, the parent class. So what we're saying here is there'll be collisions between different kinds of nodes. We don't really care what type those are. Inside that, we check whether the object collided with is called good, i.e. a good slot, or bad, a bad slot. But either way, we just destroy the ball. We don't really care what happens, whether it's coll good collides a good slot or a bad slot, we just destroy the ball. And the destroy method itself takes the ball sprite kit node and immediately calls remove from parent on it, which removes a node from your node tree. Or in plain English, it removes it from our game. And you might look at this code and think it's utterly redundant, because no matter what, it's effectively the same as writing just in here, uh, ball dot remove from parent, having that instead, which is true. But trust me in this, we're going to make these methods do significantly more shortly. So having a separate one here for destroy is a good idea. With those two in place, our contact checking method almost writes itself. We'll get told which two bodies collided, and the contact method needs to determine which one's a ball that so can call collision between with the correct parameters. So we'll write did begin contact. We can now say if contact dot body A, the first body in the contact, dot node question mark dot name is equal to ball. So if the first thing we collided with is called ball, then we'll call collision between contact dot body a dot node exclamation mark object contact dot body b dot node exclamation mark. Else if contact dot body b the other body in the contact dot node question mark dot name is equal to ball, then collision between the contact 
dot body b dot node force unwrap and contact dot body a dot node force unwrap. So all we're doing is saying if the first body body a is the ball, fine. We'll call collision between object using body A for the ball, and the other thing is being body B. Uh, if body B happens to be the ball, fantastic. Well, then we can say now body B is the ball, and the other object is body A. If you're particularly observant, you may have noticed we haven't got a special case in there for when both bodies are balls, i.e. if one ball collides with another. This is because our collision between method will ignore that particular case. It triggers code only if the other nodes are named good or bad. And we're on the game now, we should see things starting to come together. We should have to drop balls and the bounces, and they should bounce like this. If they touch a slot, they'll disappear. Boom. There we go. So they disappear as soon as they hit a slot, otherwise it is good to go. Nice. You know, looking at this, I can see there's a bit of a gradient thing going on here. You can see the way the uh, glow goes in front of the bounces. If we adjust our code ever so slightly, then that thing look a lot nicer, I think. So up in Xcode, uh, where we call duh, 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 make bounce or make slot, if I put make slot before the course to make bouncer, that whole thing should look a little bit nicer. You know, it's, it's the little touches, quite frankly, that make things look better. There we go. So the glows are now behind the bounces, which is a little bit nicer, I think. Otherwise, it's unchanged. Cool. Anyway, back to the code. So as you can see, that's our remove from parent working nicely. When they hit a, a slot, it gets destroyed automatically. Now, before I move on, I want to return to my philosophical question from earlier. Did the ball hit the slot? Did the slot hit the ball, or did both happen? And that last case won't happen all the time, but it will happen sometimes. And it's important to take into account. If Spriket reports a collision twice, i.e. ball hit slot and slot hit ball, then we have a problem. And to see why, let's look at this code down here. We call collision between here and here. Then collision ultimately will call destroy. Destroy will call ball remove from parent. So the first time this line of code here runs, we'll force unwrap both nodes and remove the ball. So far, so good. The second time that code runs for the other half of the same collision, our problem strikes. We try to force unwrap something we already removed and our game will crash. So I have these two force unwraps on this line and two more here. They might seem safe because A collide with B or B with A, but they're not safe because this double collision might happen rarely. To solve this, we're going to rewrite the did begin method to be clearer and safer. We'll use guard to ensure both body A and body B have nodes attached. If either of them don't, then this is a ghost collision and we can bail out immediately. So we'll say guard let node A be equal to contact.bodya.node else return. And then the same thing for node B. Boom, like that. And now we can just say in here, collision between node A and node B. And the same down here. Except now it'll be node B and node A. So these two guards here keep us safe. They make sure if the other thing has been removed since the collision happened, which can happen sometimes, don't continue. Get out, it's a bad idea to continue. Otherwise, the code down here is exactly the same. We get rid of ball A or node A if that's the ball. Otherwise, if node B is that, we'll use node B. Uh, you can see we still have this name check here. Even that can come out as well. We could say just directly if node A dot name is ball. Otherwise, uh, if node B name is ball like that. So it's much, much simpler code. It takes a little more explanation to learn and a little bit more code plus a little philosophy. But the end result is safer. And that's always worth striving for.